Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, on this hot day to be inside in a lecture um, that's going to be fairly, hopefully not too academic. There are a lot of visuals to go along with it. And the topic of this is mostly about faces. I think that's when we get into computer vision and seeing the world through computers, the face is one part of that world that everybody seems to be interested in. What I'll start with then is this image of a device that's installed at Gatwick Airport in London and is sold by a company called Mflow. And you can see on the right that it has this pattern, an attractor pattern, LEDs spinning around. The way this camera works is that it's mounted on the ceiling and you see these lights spinning around and you look up and think, what is that device? And that's when it captures your face, right at that moment of curiosity and anxiety when you realize that you've just been subjected to facial recognition. And I had already looked up the company profile and learned a little bit about them. Um, what I did not know is uh, the way that they're being used at Gatwick according to a security contractor running the x-ray machine there is that they're tracking people going through security to make sure that it takes between five and ten minutes and if it takes longer then the security company gets fined so originally I thought these were part of the security network of an airport and they may be and they probably are. But what they're actually doing is surveillance on the security contractors who are doing surveillance on you. So it's a multi-layered world of surveillance that's full of oddities, especially in London, which is a city that's highly saturated with cameras. I just want to go back to one point I have here, which is in thinking about digital imaging, in thinking about computer vision, we often relate it to the closest thing that we know, which is photography. And I think this is a bad metaphor. Uh, it's not helpful in understanding all of the things that you can do with a digitized image, what you can extract from that, and what you can correlate between other images. So instead, one point that I want to make is if we think of a digital image as a visual database, structured with pixels, much like an SQLite uh, database or Mongo database or any other structured um, file format of information, a digital image is very similar to that. More like that than it is like a photograph, in my opinion. And when we think of it that way as a database, then we're basically allowing people or machines to read our information, so bypassing our privacy, and doing it in a way that shares some similarities to Wi-Fi. So uh, it's a bit of a leap here, but Wi-Fi is what? 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, and it's electromagnetic energy, and so is light. And so when the light is reflecting off of you, uh, it's also propagating through the electromagnetic spectrum just like Wi-Fi. You read Wi-Fi with a metal antenna that's conductive and you read visible light with a, a sensor. So they're two, they're different, but they share similar properties. Both Wi-Fi and visible light are kind of protocols for transferring information wirelessly. So I'll take a few steps back and how I got into where I am now. And for me, it started with working as a photographer, uh, working originally with film, with chemical photos, and then realizing that I kind of hated uh, what I was doing to people by subjecting them to be photographed, and then I had control of their information. Uh, sometimes it was fun, and there's a real you know, side to explore with beauty and documentation with photographs, but the way that digital cameras were being used in the, the early 2000s 
is increasingly powerful and this game of uh, predator and prey with paparazzi photographers. So I did a 180 and then I decided it would actually be much more interesting to try to block photography, photography in order to make interesting pictures. Uh, it's become so easy to take a photo, many of the exposure algorithms are automated and you don't need to do much besides click uh, a button. And sometimes the camera will click the button for you. So you don't even need to be there. And it wasn't that interesting from an art perspective. What was really interesting is how do you subvert that technology. And the, the result of that inquiry was a project called Camouflage, uh, which is an anti-paparazzi device. It's kind of a light that flashes back, except in this case it's about one quarter horsepower. So it's a very powerful device. And these are some examples of what it looks like uh, as a prototype. And this is an example of what it looks like uh, in action. The one reason that I didn't end up turning this into a product is because of all the potential lawsuits. When you look at this, you can't see very well for about 10 seconds. <laughs> So this is testing it with professional kind of paparazzi grade, the same equipment that a paparazzi photographer would use. Uh, it's a very intense light. It gives off a little bit of a blue light because it's using LEDs, which have a slight blue tint to them. After that project, I got into computer vision and thinking, well, there's so many photos that people have posted online, Flickr, Yahoo, all these social media networks that were um, developing in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, now it's something like 350 to 400 million photos uploaded per day onto these networks. But now we have slightly different privacy controls. And in the early 2000s, it was uh, a free for all, just everybody posting everything online which raised the question, what's going to happen to all those photos once they're kind of in the, the public domain where people can do web scraping, collect them, and analyze them? So this project called CV Dazzle was exploring, is it possible to block face detection? Face detection is a, a powerful way of seeing an image through an algorithm. Um, what is our future going to be like, is kind of the question I'm asking. Is it possible to evade these algorithms, or must we be subjected to the way that they want to see us? And the result is a style of hair and makeup that doesn't really cost anything. Um, and the way that it works is by reverse engineering the profile that's being used to detect you and exploiting some of the vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities are an emphasis on the nose bridge, which is the area in between the eyes, where the eyes meet the nose, and the symmetry between the left and the right cheek, the brightness on the cheekbone. So you can see that the gradient goes the opposite way, much like counter shading and camouflage. On the right, there's asymmetry, and the nose bridge is obscured in the image on the right. So what you see at the end is an important part of the way that face detection works, that there's no such thing as a face. It's all a probabilistic score, meaning that some person has to go into the algorithm and say, I'm willing to accept this many false faces in order to get all of the possible faces. So somebody tunes it and they say, yeah, we're willing to accept, we want to be greedy, we want to get all of the faces, and we're okay with getting a few that aren't really faces. Or you have a conservative operator who says, I only want faces that are absolutely faces. And so what you see in the green squares is the confidence score that somebody would use to tune it. And 
On the left, there are probably 20 or 30, which means very high confidence. Definitely a face, no matter who's doing the op operating the variables. And on the right, one, which means it's not a face, according to the algorithm. According to you all, you can see that it's definitely a face. Now you, can, you can look through that algorithm in a slightly different way, as a heat map or a saliency map. You can kind of see what parts of the image are face-like. And as I said, there's really no such thing as a face. It's only a probabilistic score. So in designing camouflage for computer vision, the goal is to figure out where that threshold is and then just go one step below it. And when you go one step below it, no matter how small that step is, then you disappear. Um, after that project, I got thinking, what are other ways of being seen and possibly not being seen? And in 2012, I started experimenting with what thermal imaging um, was, was allowing us to see and where this technology was going to end up. At the time, and still currently, thermal imaging is one of the primary sensors on a military drone. It's a very effective way to locate someone on the ground. You can see people at night. You can see people when they can't see themselves. And the cost of thermal imaging was dropping fast. So it was clear that thermal imaging was and is part of the military uh, imaging payload, but it's also a consumer technology. And what does it mean to see somebody thermally in a way that we can't see ourselves? And you can kind of see through clothing, not in a, not in a nice way. Uh, thermal imaging is not a flattering image at all. But it's definitely on the creepy end of the spectrum. So the idea with this project was, again, do we have to be seen the way that this technology is looking at us? Or is there a crack? Is there a way to exploit a weakness? Is there a weakness? And there is. Uh, thermal energy, which your body is radiating, um, probably a lot today, but on average, about 100 watts. So you're equivalent to an incandescent light bulb. That's why it's so easy to see somebody at night in the thermal, in the thermal spectrum. And the way that it works is there's a, the garment is silver. It's silver plated fabric and it's real silver. So they're expensive, but silver is thermally reflective. So if you put silver between you and the imaging sensor, then you're not there. And so what's nice about this fabric is that you could also do it with a space blanket, uh, a marathon blanket, you know, the aluminized mylar, which crinkles. It sounds like a bag of potato chips. And nobody would want to wear that. <laughs> but if you, if you, you know, reimagine it and redesign it and present it in a way where the fabric is drapeable and can be designed as a fashion garment, then it, it opens up your mind to, to new ways of wearing this type of camouflage and of appearing and disappearing. So the project then was about how provocative could I be with this idea? And I thought the most provocative thing I could do was to turn it into a burqa design. Because a lot of the technology was being used in the Middle East. Where would people be the most vulnerable to thermal imaging? But also, what kind of garment provides the most um, surface area, uh, ability to work with, to provide shielding? So the neat thing for me was, in working on this, that I realized the, the religious idea behind a burqa, traditionally, it's seen as a separation between man and God. And in this project, I'm reimagining that as a, providing a separation between man and drone. So it has, it has a, an updated way of looking at it in terms of contemporary surveillance technologies. And one more piece from that collection is the anti-drone hijab. So now you can play a game and try to find the person wearing the burqa. It's a bit hard because of the projection illumination. You see one person here, two, 
three, four, but there's a fifth person. And they're standing right behind the van. So if you can see, there's a, just a little dark spot kind of directly behind the van in the middle of it. So now I'll play the video and it'll be very obvious. When there's motion, that changes the way that you see the image. Okay, so now you see the legs. <laughs> Um, that's an intentional part of the design. And this is in the winter, so there's a very high temperature differential. You'll see somebody walk out of the store who's been in a very warm store and they kind of look like they're on fire. So that's to show that it can work. This is some extra footage that you can see how it looks when somebody's putting it on and the thermal barrier that it creates. Okay, so I think you get the point with this one. You're probably thinking these are just kind of uh, eccentric art projects. Who would wear them? These are impractical. Yes, um, they're designed to be provocative and they're experimental and they're proof of concepts. I don't expect people to start wearing them right away, but they're exploring new ways of appearing. And even though they're within the art project way of thinking about the world, they also appear in some unexpected places, like in this tweet from the Pentagon, in a request for a classified intelligence document. So why is it that we see these things and think, ah, oh, that would be so ridiculous to go through the effort of trying to hide from surveillance technology, when at the same time, the people taking it very seriously, and the people taking it seriously are people who are in positions of power. So maybe it's not that silly. Uh, maybe it's not that eccentric to imagine appearing in these new ways in, in the present or in the not too distant future. So those, those are kind of projects that have led me to where I am now, which is uh, in a different perspective. So seeing that a new technology like this comes out every year and it's impossible to keep up with appearing <laughs> in a way that obstructs the vision from one of these systems. So I decided to take a step back and try to create uh, a broader perspective, a more informed perspective on just what it means to be seen through a digital imaging system. And that starts with one pixel. So what I'd like to do is kind of go through um, uh, from one pixel up to 100 and share some things that I've discovered in the last year about what you can do with a very small amount of information. Like one pixel is boring. Nobody would ever show their friend one pixel and say, hey, look at this photo that I took. But there, there are 256 possibilities that you can represent in one pixel. And actually, it's quite interesting what you can do with that. If you were to look at every frame, it would take 4.2 minutes. Here are two frames going back and forth. And you probably can't see it because it's not within the threshold <coughs> of the human perceptual system. But to a machine vision algorithm, these are two totally different images. And when I put the color value in hex on top of it, then it's very obvious. Yeah, so I said you can do something interesting. Well, you can take the Times New Roman font set, A through Z, 0 to 9, lowercase, uppercase, and you can encode that as one pixel, each letter, with 97% uniqueness. Then you could write somebody a sentence in pixels. 
that they could never read, but a computer could read it. Uh, the most unique character among that data set is the letter M, meaning the letter M has the most separation between other values. If we go back and look at this, you can see M is quite bright compared to the other ones. So M is the most unique of all the times the Roman characters. That's interesting if you're doing um, visual forensics. For example, a lot of people have something they don't want people to know, and they pixelate it, and then they post it online. I've been running a research project where I collect that information and try to figure out if I can undo it. And this is a uh, sample from a few years ago that someone posted, and I challenged them and said, yeah, you shouldn't uh, be posting this information. And they said, you know, I challenge you to try to undo what I posted. So then I wrote this algorithm, which is kind of a genetic algorithm or a hill climb algorithm. And you'll see what happens real quick. So the randomized text turns into Ernest. And in fact, that was his name. So now you can look at this, and now each letter is encoded into two pixels. So at two pixels, you're not really safe. You can, in, you can decode a lot of information at two pixel resolution if you know the font set. So it turns out that low resolution information is quite useful and contains a lot of information. A two by two pixel image or four pixels would take 4.3, uh, there are 4.3 million combinations. That would take you 136 years to look at every one of them at one frame per second. So we can speed that up to about 10 frames per second and then only spend 13 years looking at it. <laughs> when we go to four by four, there is so much information contained in this very small image that if you assign every person in the world their entire life spent looking at this image at 10 frames per second, you would never see every combination of this image. Meaning four by four pixels is beyond the perceptual system of the entire human race. So now it's pretty interesting, I think. And it's only four by four. Eight by eight kind of tends towards infinity, the amount of combinations. And we're still, we're only in grayscale. Most images are RGB and they look like this. So what happens in computer vision is that's actually so much information that you don't even need it, that you throw out the color information and you go back to grayscale. That's plenty of information. In fact, that's enough information for me to do facial recognition on every person in this room right now. According to this research report from last year, you only need six by seven pixels to do facial recognition on a data set of about 40 to 50 people. And if those people look a lot different, then you could do it on, on a greater number of people. If the people look all the same, and in this case they were because it was the AT&T faces data set of all white male engineers, or I think 90% white male. Now if we go back to eight by eight, you can, you can create a, a search engine for images because there's so much information at eight by eight. If you take your eight megapixel capture from your iPhone, reduce it to eight pixels, eight by eight pixels, then you can search, you can use that as a query and as a unique signature. So this is one way that people will search for copyright infringement by reducing an image to eight pixels and then you search for anything that's similar to it. And at 14 by 14, there's only an 18% reduction in the ability to do facial recognition compared to the original. At merely 12 by 16, you can do human activity recognition, meaning here's somebody standing, here's somebody sitting, here's somebody walking down the street, here's somebody on a bicycle, which raises the question, if you're building a um, system to track pedestrians in a city, do you really need to store HD footage 
Probably not. And that's the point of the paper, is exploring how you can do some maybe useful things for data collection and minimize the impact on privacy. This is a 24 by 24 space where you have encoded nearly the entire dimensionality of how a human face could exist. So this is the definition of a face detection profile and the definition of the one that I exploited in the project with hairstyling. At 40 by 40, this is really all the information you need um, to isolate, to do face detection, and to begin to do facial analysis, meaning you can do some age estimation, emotion, and you can do some facial recognition. Of course, if you increase that to about 100, then you have all the information that you need. So 100 by 100 is a lot of pixel information, but it's not a lot compared to what we normally capture with our phones or our cameras and post online. Um, if we took a small sample of what we post online, say to Instagram, we're looking at 2.5%. And yes, I realize Instagram size is now larger, so that's an even smaller number, maybe 1.5%. Uh, now, what can you do with that information? 100 by 100, 2.5% of a single Instagram photo. Let's say somebody posts a photo from tonight, uh, maybe of me, hopefully not, on Instagram. Using that 100 by 100 pixel crop of that image, you can run it through algorithms, such as this one from last year, that will infer criminality. So this is an example of AI phrenology, and it's a paper that was heavily criticized on Twitter Nonetheless, it doesn't mean people aren't doing it. This is only one example of a larger field of research that's making inferences about who you are based on how similar the information in your 100 by 100 pixel image of your face is to other people. And when you read this and realize what they're doing, they're making inferences based on lip curvature, the eye inner corner distance, the nose mouth angle, and using that information to decide whether you are a criminal or not. Well, it sucks if you have a lip curvature that's similar to a criminal. Doesn't mean you're a criminal, but this paper and this algorithm uh, structures the world that way. And what they say, the summary, is that they can see, and in the background, you see these, these faces, and their claim is that the criminal face and the non-criminal face populate two very distinctive manifolds, meaning, according to them, according to their research, some people are just a criminal, and you can tell by looking at them. Again, they're not alone in making these bold claims. This is a research paper also from last year that's making inferences about your psychological state based on about 100 by 100 pixels. And if I zoom in and we look at a few of these, one of them is intelligent. So measuring your IQ, measuring how smart you are, maybe how well you're, you'll perform in life, based on 100 by 100 pixels. And they're also looking at how weird you are, how trustworthy, sociable, kind. Again, these are, these are inferences, not truth. But when people put these into action, into products, or into possibly law enforcement, or different profiling programs, then they, they enact it and it becomes a form of truth sort of non-truth, truth. Other things that are happening in this uh, research area from 2011, so quite a while ago, uh, researchers were able to figure out what decision you're gonna make with 20% higher accuracy than you could. Well, that's great if you are into predicting consumer behavior, because then you know exactly what someone is gonna, 
is going to do next and is going to buy next. And then you can manipulate their behavior to steer them towards the most profitable outcome. But this one's even better. This is from a company called Jetpack. And what Jetpack would do is scrape all the images from Instagram and analyze them. In the top one, you see the hipster mustache. And what they would do is they would look for guys with curly, eccentric, hipster mustaches, and then try to correlate that to coffee shops to figure out where were the hipster coffee shops. Then they made a visual guidebook for tourists so that if you're visiting Ljubljana and you want to know where the hipster cafe is, then you would, you would be um, directed to the cafe where people with eccentric mustaches have been posting Instagram photos. <laughs> um, the one on the bottom is even better. They're also looking at girls wearing lipstick and using that information to try to determine uh, where there would be bars with single women and then again offering that information in a guidebook to uh, people visiting that city. My, my favorite part of this is that Jetpack scraped and they mined Instagram and they, Instagram is owned by Facebook and they sold that to Google. So they basically sold Facebook to Google. <laughs> this one is a research study looking at measuring the width of a man's mouth and using that to determine his capabilities as CEO. And the paper claims that a wider mouth on a man equates to higher performance as a CEO, unless it's for an NGO. <laughs> <laughs> then it's the opposite. Those who appear less powerful to people actually tend to have more success. Where are the, all these algorithms and the training sets coming from? Are they coming from photos that people post online? Maybe some that you posted online. A lot of them initially came from celebrity data sets. LFW, which was the first uh, facial data set collected online entirely of celebrities, labeled faces in the wild. Wild meaning they don't need to worry about copyright issues. Uh, free on the internet was 5,000 people, which was pretty big compared to earlier data sets, and 13,000 images. I think that was 2003 when that was first introduced. And uh, recently, in the last two or so years, there have been two big data sets that have come out. One is called Megaface, which has one million photos, and the other one is called uh, Microsoft MS Celeb, and they claim to have 100,000 celebrities and 10 million images of all of them. I don't know if there are really 100,000 celebrities. I'm not sure where their, what their parameters are for deciding what makes a celebrity, but it's in their favor if you consider yourself a celebrity, because when you do, then you have to give up some privacy. And in this case, you also seem to have to agree to become part of a facial training set. Some of these are used for products like Jetpack to make silly things like a guidebook for a city. But a lot of them are used for what you would expect, which would be government agencies um, honing their facial recognition capabilities with images from Flickr. And that's exactly what happens. This is a slide from 2013, a company called Noveta, which does contracting for U, a USG agency. I didn't mention which one, but you can, you can guess. There are only a few. And what they're doing is facial evaluation, uh, facial recognition performance tests. And where do they get the images? Flickr, Twitter. But one thing that's very disturbing, if you look at this slide, uh, and I pixelated some of the images on the bottom. They're babies. These are photos of babies that are being used to hone government uh, surveillance programs for facial recognition and facial analysis. 
And the last bullet point you should read, because what it says is that it's limited to non-US persons, according to photo coordinates posted. So if you post a photo, you know, according to what's written here on Instagram, there's a good chance that it may end up becoming a part of a data set that's used to hone facial recognition for various uh, government surveillance programs. There are some other things you can do with that besides facial recognition, which is what everyone focuses on. And I think it's important to realize that facial recognition is kind of an entry level term for more advanced ways of extracting information. Uh, and here's one example of extracting heart rate from a webcam quality image. So with a short video clip that you post online, then you can, you can also get someone's pulse. Just looking at that slide deck uh, that I showed with the Flickr images, from the same slide deck, looking at how many faces were used. And the raw numbers, Twitter, 2 million. Instagram, nearly 2 million. Facebook, Flickr, TwitPic, YFrog. Now I said 100 pixels is kind of the, the sweet spot for what you can do with facial analysis. Maybe it's worse. This is a recent um, sample, a preview posted by someone working at Twitter. He was able to synthesize an image from 11 by 11 pixels. This is an, an example of a generative adversarial network uh, and a thing called super resolution, which are similar in that if you feed a, a deep neural network enough similar information, then it can begin to make inferences about what you look like in higher resolution. So in this case, you can see the middle one is the one that he created, and the one on the top is the image he started with, and the one on the bottom right is the actual image. Not bad for a prototype. Other things you can do with that, this is an open source version of a 3D reconstruction program that's on GitHub. And you can take one single image, so 100 by 100 pixels, possibly 11 by 11, and then you can turn that into a 3D mesh, uh, approximately. Approximately Kanye West, but not that great. <laughs> so going back to some of the questions that I was mentioning in the beginning about photography. Is this a talk about photography? Are these examples of photography? No. These are examples of how images are structured information, uh, how they're visual databases, and how a very small amount of information compared to what we're used to working with provides a great deal of insights 50 by 50, even that small of an image, it begins to tell the unique story of your life. It correlates your identity between one photo and the next. That photo contains more visual metadata, such as the location, other people in the image, brands in the image, clothes that you're wearing. Even at 20 by 20, you can still determine the identity of someone. And so these very small uh, pixel views or visual databases, they begin to encode your life. And these are not just photographs or pixels, but these are also databases that contain a great deal of information about, about who you are. So I think that when we look at these, they're complex, the algorithms are complex, and the number of possibilities in terms of thinking about them are complex, but if we keep reducing it to smaller and smaller quantities, then things make a little more sense. And when we look at just one pixel at a time, then we can see, we can break it down and begin to see exactly what, what we can do with that from kind of a human perspective. And so, thinking about 
uh, appearing and disappearing with computer vision, this is the approach that I've been exploring, is how to think about uh, the complex world of computer vision, one pixel at a time and one algorithm at a time. And by doing that, um, been able to I think about new ways of appearing, and one of the, the new projects that I'll end with is called Hyperface, which takes a different approach. So you can think about blocking or breaking a face detection algorithm, but if you know that the face detection algorithm wants to find a face, and if you know that a face needs to be there, then there's another approach to camouflage. So camouflage, if you break it down into simple terms, is the relationship between the figure and the ground, where camouflage would be blending the figure and the ground together. In this project, Hyperface, then it's thinking about how you can create a different ground for your face to blend into instead of obstructing the view and blocking it. And what that looks like is, is a pattern that's synthesized to provide the ideal face to an algorithm. So if you know exactly what it's looking for, then you can give it that. And then your face begins to blend in to a background of faces. And the computer, in this case, doesn't know which one is real and which one is not. So I'll end here, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. But a lot of the projects that I mentioned are projects that I keep working on. Uh, they're iterative and they fold back when I collaborate with people into new ideas. So they're always kind of uh, in development. And a word that I really like to describe them uh, was invented by a friend called Borange. And if you've never heard this word, it's one of the greatest words. Borange means having the qualities of inelegant iterative step uh, that works, but eventually will be replaced by something better. So I'll end with Borange. It's pronounced like orange. Borange is Borange. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>